Hey everyone, and welcome back to Junk Jewels. So today, we're gonna to continue the series Extravagant Junk that we started last week by making vegan junk cookies. Now these are some of my most highly requested cookies. They are super chewy, crispy, soft, and gooey all at the same time, just like a traditional chocolate chip cookie, but have a little bit of a twist. So I call them junk cookies because not only are my junk jewels and these are my signature cookies, but because as you can see behind me, we put a lot of snacks in them. So as I get started, I wanna say that um, I'm gonna be talking a lot about vegan baking tips here and some of the things that I found that work really well. I was vegan for a couple of years, uh, back like in 2012 to 2014, 2015, and I am lactose intolerant. So I'm always looking for dairy-free substitutions and it's really easy often to then push that baked good into becoming vegan as long as it doesn't require eggs. And now what I found with these cookies is they hold together really, really nicely, do not require eggs, and taste just like your favorite dairy-filled, buttery, egg-filled chocolate chip cookies. The other great thing about these cookies is they're highly customizable. So you can add whatever junk food is your favorite, whatever you have around. I personally am a big fan of salty and sweet combos. So you'll see me use a lot more salty and savory snacks into my actual uh, cookie dough, as well as some chocolate and a couple sweet snacks. So let's dive in. Um, first, we're gonna be talking about vegan butter substitutes. So there's so many on the market now. The last few years have seen the rise of brands like Mykonos, uh, there's always the classic Earth Balance. Country Crock started making their own vegan butter substitutes. Um, and I've played with them all. I mean, I've probably experimented with, I don't even know how many at this point, dozens of vegan butters. Um, and I found that two reign far supreme over others. So the first is the Miyoko's. So this one is cultured European style vegan butter. And you'll see this one is unsalted. Or I'm sorry, this one is a hint of sea salt, but they do make an unsalted. And this is made from cashews and coconut cream. So it is not safe for nut allergies if you have a cashew allergy, but it is soy free. It is obviously dairy free and vegan, um, and it doesn't contain any sort of peanut ingredients or palm oil, which is really great. I'm a super big fan of this one. This vegan butter is the most neutral tasting I've uh, ever tried, and it's also the most stable. So what's really great about this vegan butter is it makes a really nice like buttercream or frosting. It whips up super nice, it stays thick, and it holds its body, it doesn't separate, which is the problem with a lot of vegan butters. And then my classic, what I call the workhorse of vegan butters is the Earth Balance Buttery Sticks. I really like the soy-free ones because if you uh, need to accommodate a soy allergy, no soy in this, works the same as the one with soy. And this is mainly a vegetable oil-based um, butter. And so it's a little more similar to margarine and it doesn't contain nuts, which is also great. So this is very allergen friendly, great for traditional bakes like brownies, cookies, um, muffins, scones, things of that nature. But I will say that it separates and melts a little more easily than the Miyoko's. So I would use this more in baked products as opposed to like in a frosting or something that you're not baking because it is more likely that it could separate or really just soften at room temperature. So today, because we're making a traditional cookie dough, I will be using the Earth Balance soy-free buttery sticks. It's also a lot cheaper, I will say too, which is great. Um, this one's about five to six dollars, depending on where you buy it, for a pound of vegan butter. And the Miyoko's is typically around the same price, but for half of that, for only eight ounces. So I'm a big fan of the Earth Balance for baked goods. So I'm gonna be using that today. I'm gonna throw this back in the fridge, so it doesn't melt. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so today's recipe, I'm going to use a kitchen scale. Highly, highly recommend for a lot of bakes. Just better precision. You don't have to be as careful about how you measure things if you use a scale because it's going to be precise every time. This one was like $15 on Amazon. Just get one that can do ounces and grams. Super, super useful. And we're gonna start by taking the bowl of a stand mixer. You can definitely do this with a hand mixer or by hand. It's just gonna take a little longer. And we're gonna zero out our scale and start with the earth balance. 
So this one contains a decent bit of butter. We're gonna use about 180 grams, which is almost a third of a pound. So we're gonna open this up and I like to cut the butter up a little bit into chunks just so it incorporates more easily. You'll notice I'm super messy when I bake. Just kind of haphazardly throwing things in there. <laughs> Make sure I don't get any foil. All right, so one stick is 112 grams. So we're gonna end up using about a half of another stick. Maybe a little bit more. So it's a decent bit of butter, um, but fat is where cookies derive a lot of their texture and flavor from. So it's really important that you have a good amount. All right, that's 165. 171, and this should be 180. 179, so close to being exact. All right, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, now I'm gonna throw that back in the fridge. And in the meantime, I'll get my stand mixer ready to go. I wanna note that you're gonna hear my stand mixer make some weird noises. I just started uh, doing a little bit of weird stuff recently. I have had this KitchenAid mixer for about eight years, got it in 2012. And it's been used a lot. Like I have a baking business, right? Junk Tools is my business. And so I do a lot of orders in here. I overfill the mixer from time to time. I've moved multiple times. It's taken a beating. I've actually moved four times since then. Yeah. And it's still been okay. So I, I highly recommend KitchenAid mixers. I'm on the hunt for a bigger one. They're all sold out right now post Christmas, but I'm going to get a bigger kitchen mixer. This is a four and a half quart bowl. I'm um, looking to get a seven quart bowl. So, uh, oh, and this, this is super cool. This spatula has um, the silicon edge. It helps scrape the bowl so you don't have to do it manually. So I'm going to start mixing this at about medium speed. You hear that? It's kind of like, it's like hitting the side. There's something going on with it. And then as that is beating, I'm going to add some sugar. So much like the mix-ins for the junk cookies, I have a list here of a couple of different options. So I always like to use brown sugar in cookies. It's what gives it a lot of moisture. It's what really makes a cookie tender. And if you didn't know, the reason brown sugar is brown is because they condition the sugar on molasses. So that's why when you smell sugar, it has that almost like honey-ish kind of smell. That's for molasses. So we're going to do 150 grams of brown sugar, which is like two thirds to three quarters of a cup. And then the other options I go with are either coconut sugar, muscovado sugar, or just classic white sugar. So I'll go with coconut or muscovado sugar if I want a little bit of like texture or more depth of flavor, a bit a little bit more like nuttiness. Or I'll go with classic white sugar if I want a more basic chocolate chip cookie recipe. So I'm gonna go with regular sugar. This one from Trader Joe's, this organic sugar is actually a little bit thicker, like thicker granules, um, a little bit bigger than typical like Domino or store brand white sugar, which I do really like. So I'm gonna go with 180 grams of this, which is like a, almost a cup. It's a decent bit of sugar, but I always like a mix. That's like the secret to really solid. Uh, classic chocolate chip cookies is a mix of brown and white sugar. There's very few cookie recipes I use that don't use both. All right, so we're gonna add this to the mixer. Also, it's really kind of wild, but there are some sugars that are not vegan. It's because they process them through charred bones of animals. So highly recommend confirming either, it might say on the side, like if you can read here, this one says vegan. As a little V. Or to check online if you're uncertain if a sugar is vegan. Something I learned while I was vegan. Some beer is not vegan, some wine is not vegan. Things that you think, oh, this is literally made from a plant, why would it be vegan? The way it is processed is using a byproduct of animals. So you might want to check on that if you are vegan or you're concerned about that at all. Alright, so I'm gonna let this be. Now my butter's a little cold, so it is kind of falling up a tiny bit. 
which is fine. The friction from the mixer will start to warm the butter, softening it and getting it combined. And you want to come at it like moderately well. Um, a lot of cookie recipes that will ask you to whip the butter really extensively. And that's great for certain types of cookies. I found that with vegan cookies, if you beat it too much, the oils kind of start to separate in the vegan butter and it will lead to more spread. Um, so I like to make sure it's well combined without being like heavily, heavily whipped. So, so like that. Now I'll make another uh, really popular cookie recipe next time I stream, but that one I almost take a scone approach and I keep the butter into cold chunks and then I mix it very lightly because I actually want like little bits of butter that start to melt as the cookie forms. Um, and it leads to like a, a chunkier, higher, much more like buttery smooth, silky cookie. Uh, okay, so that is ready to go. Now the last couple things I'm gonna add are vanilla. You can either do vanilla or vanilla bean paste I love this because you get a little flex of vanilla in it. This is typically really expensive, like a jar this size would be like 10, 15 bucks. But Trader Joe's occasionally gets it in and this is $5. And it's two ounces, so it lasts a good bit of time. Because vanilla paste is so concentrated, you can use about half of what you would normally use in a recipe. So I'm just gonna go with like half a teaspoon. I don't measure teaspoons and tablespoons, I'm not great about that. And then something I like to add is cinnamon. So again, these are junk cookies. They can have any flavor profile you want. I've done like cookies and cream flavored with Oreos in them. I often do like salty sweet, like I'm doing today with pretzels and potato chips. Sometimes I'll do cookie butter and speculoos cookies like I have here, or I'll do like an apple butter and pumpkin. You can really add whatever you want. You can make a coffee flavored, you can make it filled with chocolate. I like a little cinnamon for warmth, just like a tiny bit, a couple shakes. Give it a quick pulse. And then my secret, my absolute secret ingredient to great cookies for every cookie, but especially vegan, like corn syrup. Corn syrup gets a really bad rap um, just because it's refined corn, refined sugar. All refined sugar is the same. It's not the best for you, but in moderation, it's fine. Um, and the great thing about corn syrup is that it helps bind cookies. So I find this to be one of the best ingredients for vegan cookies because it can substitute eggs. It can help bind the flours and the butter, the sugar, like all the wet and dry ingredients together without using an egg substitute that might give a flavor to the cookies. So I know that flax eggs are really popular for vegan baking. I'm personally not a fan of flax eggs. I find that they make everything taste like flaxseed. And flaxseed's fine, but I don't want my cookies tasting like flaxseed unless I'm purposely making like a trail mix flaxseed cookie. So, what I'm gonna do instead is add light corn syrup, and I go with light because it doesn't contain caramel color or any molasses or anything that'll make it taste like anything except sugar. And I put about a tablespoon for every batch I make. Um, now these t batches of cookies typically make like 12 pretty big ones or 18 um, smaller cookies. And so I'll do a tablespoon for this. Again, I'm not the best at measuring exactly for <laughs> teaspoons and tablespoons, uh, just because I, I eye it so often, I'm really used to this recipe, I could probably do it with my eyes closed. And this one's almost done. I have, a new, I have a new bottle if I need it, but I'm just gonna try to use up every single little bit that I have. And this is like really my, my favorite. Um, I haven't experimented too much with like just egg or any of those other vegan egg substitutes that kind of gel up and cook them. Um, I worry that those would separate and curdle and like make little bits of scrambled egg style things in the bake. Um, the only other thing I can really think to use is aquafaba, which is canned chickpea juice. That would help uh, with binding starches with sugars and fats. So that might be a good option as well. Just corn syrup is so inexpensive. It's so readily available and it works so, so well. I use it in the vast majority, honestly, of my cookie recipes. Even if it's like a teaspoon or a tablespoon total in a huge batch, I find it's really, really helpful. All right, how long can I pour this for? I'm gonna start mixing while I finish it. All right, 
And I will say, if you don't necessarily care about making these vegan, or you can't make them vegan because you don't have vegan butter in your house and you just want to make like a traditional cookie and you have all the rest the recipe ingredients for it, uh, the only thing you would change is same amount of butter, you can use dairy butter, and then instead of a tablespoon of corn syrup, put about a teaspoon of corn syrup, just enough to like help make the cookies tender, and add one egg. So one egg will help bind it. If you don't care about it being vegan, go ahead and add the egg. Um, and now comes the dry ingredients. So this is pretty standard for most cookie, brownie, cake, any kind of recipe, is measure the dry ingredients separate after you've beat the wet ingredients together. So what I have here is just plain old all-purpose flour. I really like, here, I'll take it out of the bag so you can see it. I really like King Arthur brand, classic. A really gold medal, any unbleached all-purpose flour will do. And I use just like a handheld sifter. <laughs> I'm a big fan of this. Oh, hey, the Bachelor, did we fix our issues? Yes, my oven's been working all week. Thank you for asking. If you were in my stream last week, my oven, uh, the pilot wouldn't ignite. Um, and I had to clean out the bottom, like unscrew the entire bottom of the oven and clean it. It's working mostly. A technician is coming tomorrow just to check it out and make sure it's still okay. But I've been baking all week, so we're good to go. Thanks for asking. All right, so as I was saying, I use a handheld sifter. Highly recommend sifting your flour. If you don't have a sifter, totally fine. If you have a strainer like this one, that's pretty fine mesh, you can use that. Like I use this for rice, pasta, vegetables, things like that. Or alternatively, you can just take a wire whisk and whisk the flour really well to get out any clumps. Now, purpose of sifting is so your flour is really, really fine and soft so that when you mix it into the wet ingredients, there's not like really big chunks that kind of open up when you, you bake. That would be terrible. So, zeroing out my bowl, 215 grams of all-purpose flour, which is about a cup and a half, cup and three quarters. And then I'm gonna sift that together with some salt and a leavening agent. Um, you can use baking powder or baking soda. Um, I don't actually remember, I use both. I use both in this one. Baking powder is actually just baking soda with some cornstarch. I actually like to add a little more cornstarch on top of it. Seems redundant, but I can just measure more carefully. So I'm gonna take about a half of a teaspoon baking powder, a half a teaspoon of baking soda. Wow, real precise. The important part is just to get some leavening agent in there. A teaspoon of salt. Oh, my timer. Are you all like me? Do you set like 12 different timers to remind yourself to do things like literally take out the laundry or like clean something or go to the grocery store? Because I literally forget all those things if I don't set timers, alarms. Okay, and then about a teaspoon and a half of cornstarch. Now cornstarch, in addition to corn syrup, is my other secret ingredient for vegan cookies. A lot of cookies, honestly, but vegan especially. So cornstarch helps create a tender bake. And when you don't have the eggs and the regular butter, sometimes vegan cookies can get almost like dried out. They get, the sugar gets over caramelized. They're kind of like too crispy. And if you want that hybrid crispy and soft chewy cookie, highly recommend a little bit of cornstarch. It keeps your cookies also softer for longer. Cookies don't really go bad if they're kept in an airtight container for like over a week, usually like eight to 10 days. But if you put the corn syrup in there, as well as the corn starch, the texture will stay really good for that full week to 10 day period, really. So you can either mix this down with like a fork or spoon, or just do the lazy thing, which is take the sifter and pick it up and mix it that way. I like to make as little dishes as possible because you see the size of my kitchen. I bake out of my home for my business and I'm the one doing all the dishes and cleaning. Um, and so I'm running the dishwasher basically every single day. So I like to make as little dishes as possible for a single recipe. All right, so we're gonna mix this in with the wet ingredients and then I'm gonna start adding the fun stuff. I'm very excited for that. And then as I mix in the dry ingredients, there's also one other 
secret ingredient. This is not just for vegan cookies though. We'll do this slowly. I always get flour everywhere. And that is ground coffee. So I love a little bit of coarse ground coffee in my cookies. I know it might sound kind of wild, but it just like gives it this little unexpected bitterness, smokiness, depth of flavor. I'm a very big fan of it. So I just take about a tablespoon, mix that in. All right, I'll let that mix for another second longer. Check to make sure I didn't miss anything. I like to do that, check my recipes. Cool, all right, so the final step before we add in the mix-ins is just checking the texture of our dough. So I'm gonna grab a spatula and you want the dough to not be quite so crumbly, to stick together but not be wet by any means. So make sure you get all of the wet ingredients all combined, dry, give it one more mix. And because it's a little crumbly, what I like to do is add like a tiny, tiny little bit of vegan milk. My absolute favorite for drinking, for baking, for anything is Ripple. They make unsweetened vanilla, sweet vanilla, sweetened chocolate, um, unsweetened regular, and it's pea protein based milk. So it is soy free, it's dairy free, it's nut free. It's like every allergen friendly basically. It's actually telling me to lock my mixer. Yeah, so my I was saying this at the beginning of the stream, my mixer is like on the way out. Um, so even when I lock it, it clicks. I am on the hunt for a new KitchenAid. This one's pretty old and I do a lot of moves. So yeah, it's a good reminder to lock it, but it also makes those noises regardless. All right, so I just put about two teaspoons. And that should be just about right. Yep, all right, so what you want is when you pick the dough up, it stays together very easily when you roll it into a ball. It gets smooth very easily, pieces don't start to come off. Perfect. All right. Put this milk away. And now my favorite part where you can get super creative. Um, so I like loosely measure what I put in just to make sure I'm not putting so many junk food ingredients um, or additions that I have more than I do dough, right? We wouldn't want to get to a point where there's so many pretzels and potato chips and pieces of popcorn and everything in here that the dough can't like adhere together because there's things in the way, there's dry ingredients in the way. So I do tend to keep it to about one to one and a half um, ratio of mix-ins to dough. So like I'll put about, let's say I have a cup of dough, I'll put like a half to two thirds a cup of um, mix-ins into it. So what I'm gonna do today is my classic potato chips and pretzels. I really like the wavy ones. I found that when baking, they're less likely to get soggy and they keep their crunch really well. So you could use any brand. You could also do lightly salted if you want, but I actually really like the super salty ones because I love salty sweet. So I'm gonna measure out pre-crushing, uh, just like a large handful, which is just about a cup. And then I have honey wheat pretzel sticks. So I really like dark pretzels, honey wheat pretzels, some kind of flavoring that's not like super savory. You can also get mini pretzels, pretzel twists, whatever flavor or shape you want. Similarly, this is just under a cup. It's about two thirds a cup. Caramel popcorn. So this like pre-bagged caramel popcorn doesn't actually have real caramel in it, so it's vegan. It does contain soy. Just a good note to have, a lot of these packaged foods do contain soy. So if you're going soy free, make sure to look for that. Um, but this caramel corn is vegan. It's really just like sugar, <laughs> a little bit of oil. And I'm gonna do two handfuls of this, so also about a cup. And then these. I love marshmallows and cookies. 
I didn't discover that until pretty recently, but I make these amazing peppermint hot cocoa cookies that have peppermint marshmallows. I love making s'mores cookies. And these dandies are not only some of the best vegan marshmallows I've ever tried, but by far the best marshmallows I've ever tried to bake with. They expand pretty nicely and stay pretty fluffy even on high heat, but they don't get so big and kind of explode like non-vegan marshmallows do. I found that non-vegan marshmallows sort of like melt in the oven and re-caramelize. And that's not bad, but it's not the texture I'm going for. So I have an open package of these that I'm going to use. And these are pumpkin spice flavor. They actually work really nicely with the caramel corn and the little bit of cinnamon I put in the dough. So similarly, I'm going to put about a cup. Again, it's fine if it's imperfect measurement. And then I'm not going to use the speculoos today. I decided I don't want too much cinnamon forward. But I am going to need, obviously, the chocolate in it because why would you not put chocolate chips and cookies? So these are Enjoy Life Dark Morsels. Enjoy Life are my favorite allergen-friendly chocolate chips. Most semi-sweet chocolate chips um, at like Trader Joe's or like the higher end ones like Ghirardelli or Guitard, a lot of them do not have milk in the dark chocolate chips. Some of them do though, or they're um, made on shared ingredient, or I'm sorry, they're made on factory equipment that uses shared ingredients, which if you're a strict vegan or have an allergy, you do not want to use. Enjoy Life are soy-free, dairy-free, they're vegan, they're gluten-free, they're uh, nut-free, they have nothing in them but cocoa butter, sugar, uh, and no, that's literally an unsweetened chocolate and cane sugar. So these are really allergen friendly. So I'm gonna put about a couple of those in there as well. All right. I could just like eat a bowl of this <laughs> as a snack mix. So what I'm gonna do is just use my hands to crush. You could also crush them in a food processor if you wanted. Make sure to pulse it so you don't get like a fine powder. You don't want to basically be adding like flour back into your uh, already made dough. So I'm just gonna crush. And you also only need to do like a rough hand crush if you're using a stand mixer because that'll further crush like the pretzels and potato chips and those bigger things. But like popcorn, you might want to crush a little because that might stay a little bit too big if you don't. Because I mean, like that's pretty big. <laughs> All right, that's about good. Yeah. All right, now, Add this in here. Just give it a mix for a few seconds. You can hear some of the like pretzels and potato chips are kind of breaking down a little further to get crunch, which is good. That's what I want. All right. So you'll notice that I have not turned my oven on yet, and that's by design. So with most uh, cookie recipes, especially ones that are high butter content or contain vegan butter, I recommend chilling your dough for some period of time. So I'm gonna uh, make the cookie dough into the balls that I need for baking first. Then I'm gonna freeze the dough. And I will um, make a couple of cookies without chilling just to show you what it looks like. But I, always recommend if possible at all to chill for at least a couple hours these junk cookies as well as my peppermint hot cocoa cookies that i will make on stream pretty soon those i recommend keeping in the freezer just because the way that butter adheres uh, to the flour and the dry ingredients and the way that the chill kind of permeates the whole piece of dough cooking directly from the freezer means that you're gonna have less spreading and the cookie is gonna be a little bit like higher and puffier, which I like the look of and the taste of a lot better. Uh, so I'll get started on rolling these and then I'll preheat the oven once I'm done with that, throw one in and show you uh, what it looks like if you don't chill it. Then I'll come back later, throw them in the oven and show you what they look like when you do. So let me wash my hands. I turn my phone off. We're gonna turn that ringer off. All right, now this is where a scale also comes in handy again. So I like to be as precise as possible when baking. 
especially because, again, I bake as uh, a career, uh, my business, Junk Jewels, I need consistency. If I tell someone I'm going to make them 12 cookies, they need to be 12 equally sized cookies. They need to be the same as the last time they ordered them. They need to be the same as the next time they're going to order them. So I always, always, always weigh my dough. Um, I like to make the cookies the same number of grams down to a literal gram. Um, also because when you put a lot of mix-ins into your cookie dough, that will affect how the shape turns out, sometimes how high they are, right? Like if one particular piece of uh, dough has like a lot of marshmallows in it, it's gonna be a bigger cookie because marshmallows weigh less than the dough. So you wanna be really cautious about weight and then also mix in distribution. So while I'm rolling the dough, I look to see like, okay, does this one have so, so many marshmallows or a ton of pretzels? Is that gonna like change the ratio of mix-ins to dough or the way that the cookie turns out and looks like is it gonna be more oblong or flatter? So this is an important step. I highly, highly, highly recommend weighing your cookies. So the way I'll do that is I'll first get a uh, cookie sheet prepared with parchment paper and some kind of grease. So I love what is like gold touch. These are OXO um, and I also have Williams Sonoma gold touch pans that have like these little raised edges on them. It helps release things on them more easily. Even if you're using parchment paper, it's still helpful that th this has better air circulation. It helps things release if they stick, very easy to clean. And so I get a piece of parchment paper. It's my favorite thing to bake with. And then, for this, I'll use vegetable oil. You can use vegetable oil, vegan butter, regular butter. Take a gift towel and just grease them. Even if you're using parchment, I highly recommend you grease. You don't want to stick your cookie. And especially if you're using things like marshmallows or candy in your cookies, they have a higher likelihood of sticking. All right. So we're going to see how much dough we have and then divide it by how many cookies we want to make. So pouring this into the bowl on a zero out scale. And we have 1,032 grams. I'm like decent at math, but I'm not great at mental math when it's that amount. <laughs> so in that case, let's see if I were to make 18 cookies, how big would they be? 57 grams. That's a little bigger than I wanted to make 24 cookies. So 1,032 divided by 24 is 43 grams. So I'm gonna shoot for about 43 grams. If you're trying to make a very specific number of cookies, I recommend that you scale it back a little. So in that case, it says 43 grams, but I would make it like 40 grams just in case. So you have a few extra uh, grams to work with in case you wanna make an extra cookie, in case any of them come out kind of wonky looking and not perfect and pretty, uh, then you have plenty of cookies to work with. So let's shoot for 40. And like I said, this is going to be kind of monotonous, so I'm going to talk about some vegan baking tips when I make these. But you'll notice that I'm kind of inspecting. Like this one, for example, my first one already is missing a marshmallow. So I'm going to make sure to take a marshmallow out and put one in. I know this is precise. I'm like quite the perfectionist. <laughs> so while I make these 40 gram cookies, I'm going to check the chat. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about vegan baked goods. Hi, Chancellor Morning, Marilyn. I'm doing great. How are you? Um, and then I'm going to just throw them on the sheet. So a couple recommendations I have for uh, vegan baked goods. So I talked you through the different kinds of butters I like and egg substitutes. Now, another big thing is the debate around honey. Some vegans eat it, some vegans don't. Um, that's totally fine. That's your call because it is a byproduct of an insect, but it doesn't necessarily harm the insects to take it. So I do bake with honey. I try to keep my vegan items honey free in case someone is a no honey vegan. But also like we talked about, some ingredients that you would not suspect are not vegan, like sugar, you gotta check. So if you are baking for someone who has a strict allergy or who is vegan, always make sure that something explicitly says it's not on share equipment, um, right? Like some candies, cookies, things like that might say vegan, but like on, or uh, made in a facility that also produces milk ingredients or nuts or whatever it is. So check everything uh, for allergens really well. Also, 
make sure you're not cross-contaminating in your own kitchen. So clean really well between bakes. Make sure that you uh, wash your hands and utensils before scooping into like flour bags or sugar containers or things of that nature. You saw that I keep my brown sugar in a glass container on the counter and that allows me to have a lot more control over the, the way I pour it in or if I use something to scoop it out as opposed to bags or boxes which are not airtight and can easily get things into them or hard to pour from. So I really like being organized with lots of glass jars as you can also see like back there I have my dog's treats in there. <laughs> All right, Chancellor's uh, giving me some funny scenario questions. Is this what you do, man? You just pop into people's streams and ask them silly questions. I will play, I'll play along, why not? Uh, they say, what would you do if a mean person in your life suddenly shrunk to a tiny size in front of you? You know, I'm not super vindictive. I don't like, if someone's mean, um, I'll confront them if I think they're being rude and ask them to, or t tell them kind of why they're bothering me and ask them to maybe not. <laughs> um, so it's not like I would take out my revenge on them if they suddenly became tiny. Um, I would probably try to find out why that happened and make sure that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> I think I'd be more fascinated by the science than I would about the mean person uh, shrinking to a tiny size. <laughs> what would you do? What would you do if a mean person shrunk to a tiny size in front of you? That's funny. That reminds me of my um, my husband's cousin it was like my cousin-in-law <laughs> what would you call her she her name's sarah and she likes to do what she calls sarahtheticals so hypotheticals that are so ridiculous only sarah could have come up with them and one of the most fun ones she ever asked because she um she does a lot of like event planning and things that require you to dress up so for her this was a harder question for me it was not but it was pretty funny she said would you rather have to wear workout clothes only for the rest of your life or like a tuxedo or ball gown for the rest of your life. And for someone like me who like this is fancy, like I'm wearing jeans, that's a really big deal um, because I work from home and I need to be comfortable. I was like, oh, workout clothes all the time. That's all I wear anyway. And she was like, even if you went to a black tie event, I said, even if I went to a black tie event because I go to like one black tie event every four years. So that's fine. I'll be embarrassed in my, uh, my yoga pants. <laughs> she was like, I would pick the fancy outfit because even at the gym I feel like I'm so skilled in heels like I could figure out how to make it work <laughs> wild is absolutely wild um, but she always comes up with like really funny hypotheticals that are so specific to members of her family and friend group uh, I, I like asking those hypothetical questions things you would never encounter in real life <laughs> Chancellor Marty Merlin yeah you can pick them up by their tiny shirt and examine them close to your gigantic face that's true you would have lots of control you could exert over them. <laughs> uh, this is gonna make so many cookies as you, you all can see. So what I might actually do is get some into the freezer soon so we can start chilling them and then throw one in the oven for you all to see. So I'm gonna turn the oven on. I like to bake these at about 375. And as I mentioned in my previous stream, every oven is calibrated differently. This is a brand new oven. There's problems with it if you were on my stream last week with the pilot, but point being it's like, it doesn't have wear and tear issues, but it was calibrated differently. Um, when I moved into this house a couple of years ago, I bought a, an oven thermometer and tested it and found that my oven is about 10 degrees too cold. So that means I'm gonna actually put my oven at 385, even though I call for this recipe to be baked at 375. We're good. If you were with me last week, you know that that's when my pilot decided not to work, uh, but we're good. It's working. We're fine. Um, the oven is preheating. I have a gas oven, so you can kind of hear it go Oof, when it uh, preheats. It's on. We're good. What do you all like to bake? Have you been baking for the holidays? I would love to hear in the chat. Um, are you a cookie baker? Do you like to make cakes, pies? Like what's your favorite holiday dessert? Someone in your family a good baker? Did you learn from someone in your family? I, uh, I actually come from a family of not 
<laughs> really skilled chefs or bakers. Um, my dad was always pretty good at grilling. He, he's become a good cook later in his life, but growing up, he didn't cook that much. He'd barbecue occasionally. And my mom knows how to make like basic stuff. She always makes like good roast chicken and omelets and uh, vegetables and things like that. But she wasn't super into cooking. So we didn't grow up like spending the weekends baking or anything like that. My family would rather like go out to eat or order in. And so I actually just like started experimenting as a kid. When I was like seven, eight years old, I was really interested in baking especially. And then um, I worked in food service here and there. Right after graduated college, I was a prep cook at a restaurant in Nashville uh, that I loved. Uh, Nashville's going through a hard time right now. If you're a resident of Nashville, I, I feel for you. I know a lot of people lost their homes uh, in that act of terrorism and I'm so sorry. I used to work really close to, to where the explosion was. Um, at a restaurant when they first opened and that was an incredible learning experience for me i realized i absolutely love 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 cooking and baking um took a little bit of a different path for a while ended up going to grad school for uh education policy and i in addition to having junk jewels i also work for an education nonprofit, and i really do care about educational causes and that's a big passion of mine but I have never strayed away from baking or cooking for very long and always end up coming back to it through my business, through events, through working with friends. Um, I, I love the world of cooking and baking. I keep getting pulled back into it. And so that's why I started Junk Jewels last year, in September of 2019. And my first couple of months were amazing. I live in the Detroit area and I partnered with Eastern Market Brewing in downtown Detroit to do some pop-ups. They're an incredible brewery, one of my absolute favorites in Metro Detroit, and started doing dessert pop-ups on weekends. So usually on Sundays, um, they did a really good job of marketing them, and it's a really like, collegial space. They have lots of pop-ups and events there, so people come down there not just for beer, but for all of their events. And so I had some really successful pop-ups and realized, like, this is something I really want to be doing, and like the joy I saw on people's faces when they tried my baked goods or when people told me they came down because they were really excited to try something I advertised on Instagram or Facebook. It made me so happy. And it's helping me realize that like, this is what I want to be doing with my life. Um, eventually full-time. So we'll get there. I do it part-time right now, but that's why I started this channel, uh, this Twitch live stream. And I'm going to be posting my edited videos to YouTube as well. Junk jewels on every platform on Instagram as well. And it's just a way for me to like teach more people about baking, to get the word out there about what are some great substitutes for dairy-free, vegan, all different types of baked goods, uh, gluten-free, nut-free, soy-free, so people don't feel left out. I think that's something I struggled with when I was vegan and when I, as a kid, I've always been lactose tolerant, um, feeling like I either had to have a stomach ache to partake in like birthday cake or that I felt left out and I couldn't have something. And oftentimes, you know, we'll go places and the gluten-free or vegan option or whatever it is, is like marketed as healthy. And when I want a cookie, I'm not worried about, oh, is this like high protein, high fiber? When I want a cookie, what I want is a gooey, buttery cookie, usually with like chocolate chips in it. And so I founded Junk Jewels as a way to provide people with substitutes that meet their dietary needs without sacrificing flavor or fun or creativity. So that's why you'll see me making things like junk cookies where, yeah, they're vegan, but they're not trying to be healthy or organic. I'm just trying to bring people joy who maybe don't eat dairy products or animal products. All right, I'm gonna wash my hands. I'm gonna get these in the freezer, but I'm also gonna prepare another baking sheet because I'm gonna bake uh, one or two cookies and show you what it looks like if you don't put it in the freezer. Was that loud enough? All right, I'm gonna prepare one more. Did I make the right number of cookies? I didn't even count them. 10, 15. 24, exactly the right number of cookies, like I said I wanted. 
All right, let me prepare one more. Mm -hmm. And the oil. A paper towel. And if you have silk hats, those work pretty well. They're silicone mats that replace parchment paper. But I do find that sometimes things still stick a little bit to them um, when I'm using like marshmallows or things of that nature. Parchment paper is wasteful, but it's easier to use. And I do reuse different sheets. So like I'll bake on the same sheet of parchment paper two or three times. I'll use them for packaging. Um, if it's from the same recipe, I'll keep reusing them. Unless you're baking them in a really hot oven, they're not gonna get super charred or messed up. So let's see, I'm gonna take these two cookies. And the last thing I do before I put any cookies in the oven is put a little salt on top. So I use kosher salt or any other large grain finishing salt. So these are pretty large grains like you can see, right? So I take a little bit, throw it on top, a pinch. And yes, this has cookies, I'm sorry, cookies. These cookies have pretzels and potato chips in them and a bunch of salty things, but I do like a little salt on top because not only is there a textural contrast, the soft gooey center of the cookie, that crunch of the salt, but it also really helps balance the cookie. And I find that it, it makes people want to eat more, uh, it makes me want to eat more, and it gives some interest to the cookie. Like when you bite into a really salty bite, then you want a super sweet bite with a marshmallow, then you want to go back for another salty bite. It's just like total cookie hack. <laughs> All right, the oven is almost there. It's at 340. I'm going to put these in the freezer. Let me make sure I have room. I'm going to put them in a smaller uh, tray because I don't have a ton of room in my freezer right now. So I don't own this house and I didn't design this kitchen. One day, one day, when I have my own kitchen that I can renovate or design, Mark my words, it will happen in the near future. I'm gonna have a huge fridge and freezer. I'm also gonna have double ovens. I'm also gonna have a lot more counter space. I'll probably have two dishwashers. Like I will outfit my kitchen like a commercial kitchen. Uh, now these cookies are going to go in the oven. Before I put them in the oven, my last like big trick to this is an inverted baking sheet. So I have found that with certain cookie recipes, even if you put the rack up higher and only have one pan at a time, the bottom still have a tendency to burn. If you take a cold baking sheet and put it into the oven as you put your cookies in, it's less it's likely, likely to burn, burn the bottom because of the air circulation in the bottom. Kind of like mix a convection oven in some ways. Which, which I do not have. I have to put this air around the oven. And it really helps get it on. So I just use my table to see. My rack is in the center of the oven. Not too high, too low. And the cookies are at least a few inches apart. I try to keep them like three inches apart or more. This will go in. I'm going to set my timer for six minutes, and then I will turn them around six minutes, give them another six, check if they're done. Um, I'll also give some tips on how to tell if cookies are done. So the oven is in the freezer, and I like to leave them in there for, like I mentioned, about two hours or so. But this dough is great because you could leave it in the freezer for up to a couple of days and bake them straight out of the freezer. If you've left them in for more than about 48 hours in the freezer, I recommend taking them out and letting them uh, defrost a little bit for about a half hour to an hour before you put them in the oven. But baking directly from cold, when they're mostly frozen, totally fine. Um, cookie dough, if kept in a freezer container, like a, an airtight container, a freezer plastic bag doubled up, or a ball jar, or something that like, has an airlock on it, that'll keep the freezer for a couple of months. So what I also love to do is make the cookie dough balls, have everything ready to go, throw a couple of batches in the freezer, 
I don't do this for, for fresh orders. Fresh orders, I always make fresh. But for personal use, I want to just like bake cookies for myself and my husband, or share them with like some neighbors to make a couple at a time. And I'll do that. I'll keep it in the freezer. Oh no. Batch just said there's a reverb. Is it still sounding a little bit odd? Let me know if it's still sounding odd. Um, I'm using a Logitech uh, stream cam mic input a little bit. Okay, let me check it. Thank you for telling me. Please always let me know if something's wrong with the stream. So weird. All right, I'm gonna move a couple of things and let me know if it still sounds weird. All right, move a few things out of the way. It's a little bit of a mess right now. I mentioned this in my last stream. Um, I have pork countertops. I know flex, <laughs> um, which is amazing because you can put hot and really cold stuff directly on it, and it's not gonna affect the countertop. So I really enjoy these because I can take cookies out of the oven and put them around the counter if I want. But I'm actually going to show you my dining table because this is the best investment I ever made. Travel with me. <laughs> so my dining room table, you see how shiny that is? It is stainless steel. It's basically like having a restaurant countertop, which is amazing because I can put tons of hot things directly onto it, and there's never going to be a problem in terms of like burning anything or warping the table. It is the best investment I made, and it, uh, it's something I got at West Elm, like, gosh. I think I got it also in 2012, the American Mixer, and it has withstood four moves. Uh, it's in great condition. It's pretty dang heavy. The top probably weighs like 300 pounds. But like, what a lifesaver because you see my kitchen, it's pretty small. I have like a little bit of counter space on the other side of the sink, but otherwise like all of my appliances, uh, blenders, uh, coffee grinders, mixers take up a lot of counter space. And so it's really invaluable to have that additional space where you can put hot and cold things directly on it uh, and where I can leave things to cool. Oh, thank you, Bachelor. Sounds like my laptop is playing sound. It's being really happy about my mic. You know what? My laptop fan is on, which is frustrating. Um, it's a little echo. Let me check that. All right. I'm turning off the sound and moving my left over. Okay. All right, let's hope that helps. I really appreciate the help, y'all. I'm a, I'm a newer streamer, and so I actually, funny enough, have a film degree. Um, I studied film in college. It was a little more the analysis side, less so production. I did more like studio art and set dressing kind of things in terms of production. And also I graduated college in 2012, so technology has changed quite a bit and streaming, like live streaming wasn't super, super popular when I was in school. So this is pretty new to me. And I am testing out a lot of different types of equipment, trying some new things. So I do really appreciate your feedback. If something sounds wrong um, or the quality of something's poor, please let me know and I'll troubleshoot it between streams. I also um, have been a Mac user for a really long time and I know that Macs are not the best for video production, but I learned Final Cut Pro in college and so that's what I used to edit and it's really hard to move away from that. So I do have a MacBook and yes, it's not the best for streaming um, or for video production in general, but I'm gonna work with what I got. Computers are expensive. <laughs> 
not ready to buy a new one yet, especially uh, after 2020. All right, that's the six minute timer. I'm gonna turn the cookies around. And this is just to ensure you can bake it. So halfway through, turn the cookies. Another timer for six minutes. It's starting to smell so good in here. Oh good, sounds better. Okay, so I did move my laptop over further away from the camera and the fan stopped working so hard, so I think that helps a little. Also, my house isn't that big, but it is open concept, so behind the camera is like a living space. So there is a chance I need some sort of sound buffer. Um, so I can always play with that, putting up sheets or curtains or something. Thank you. All right, and while I'm waiting, I'm gonna put some stuff away. I'm gonna prep another baking sheet and we'll tell you all some more baking tricks. The parchment's just like rolling away. So I also don't have a ton of storage in this kitchen. Like the cabinets you see behind me, these are all of my upper cabinets and then I just have some lowers right here. I do have a pantry. You see me keep like reaching back in here into the hallway. I do have a pantry back there, um, but I have so many ingredients and I go through so much so quickly, especially in the holiday season, that I have like a separate buffet in my uh, living area. That's like a, a bar type cabinet where I keep all of my, my mix-ins, my flour, my basics. Again, I do this part time, but I go through ingredients so quickly. My husband came home with a five pound container of sugar last week on like, it's pretty late in the week. It was like Wednesday or Thursday. I guess it wouldn't have been, yeah. Thursday was Christmas Eve. I think it was Christmas Eve. I ran out of that sugar yesterday. <laughs> um, I go through it super, super quick during the holidays. Um, I, this is the last of my flour. I need to go back more today. So it's really important to have good storage. That's another thing I'm going to get when I make to design my kitchen. All right, a little better organized here. I'll bag these up later. Some other really fun things I have been experimenting with lately are gluten-free cookies. So gluten-free is sometimes like a bad word, right? People are like, oh, it's gonna be cardboardy, it's gonna taste bad, I'm not into this. I have cracked the code for cookies, working on brownies, and my next foray I want to be into bread. Uh, I almost, almost hate to say this, such like millennial hipster thing. I don't feel great if I eat a lot of like bread or pasta and I'm looking for like reduced gluten or gluten-free options. And I know that there's a lot of people who can't eat gluten or would prefer to stay away from it. And so I sell a decent bit of gluten-free cookies and I have a family member who um, has a, an autoimmune disorder similar to celiacs where she cannot have any sort of gluten. And so I test a lot of recipes on her, but I really try hard to uh, make it fluffy and not dense, delicious. Um, like vegan foods, it's not that gluten-free is supposed to be marketed as like healthy or like the only option. I want it to be so good that someone really enjoys it who isn't gluten-free. Um, so I do a really good chocolate toffee gluten-free cookie. I do hot, hot cocoa peppermint cookies. Um, I do a number of different chocolate-based cookies that I really, really like that keeps it really moist. Um, I also have been making like looking at my pantry, like what's in there right now? Uh, making a lot of cornbread, making a lot of chocolate almond toffee cookies, experimenting with brown butter and a variety of different things. The holiday season has been wild. At any given moment, I have like five or six different types of cookies, brownies, cakes in my house at any time. And I do not have a big fridge or a lot of storage. So you'll see things kind of just spilling out all over the place. <laughs> yes, how did we ever survive without gluten-free? I'm gonna move my computer over so I can see chat better now that it's not making so much of a noise. Um, I also will do like paleo or refined sugar-free options. Coconut sugar and maple syrup are really good options for that. Um, and you know, like, yes, we make fun of all these different diets, but it is really important that if, if people either can't eat something because they get sick from it or have some sort of disease like celiacs, it's great. 
Or if they just like want to eat something a certain way, that's fine too. If you feel better eating vegan, you feel better eating paleo, like that's cool. I want to provide you something you're going to like that's not dry and gross and marketed to be healthy. All right, these have about a minute left. See how they're doing? They're not spreading too, too much, but they're spreading a little more than I'd like, which is why, again, I freeze or refrigerate the dough beforehand. I'm gonna prep this baking sheet because I'll start baking a couple more that have slightly chilled, show you the difference. Um, and then I can come back later and also post on Instagram the finished product so you can see what they look like once they've frozen for a couple of hours. One day I'll be prepared enough to do that sort of like movie magic where I just like take pre-chilled dough out of the freezer. I thought ahead, you know, multiple hours or days. And I go, oh, snap my fingers. It's two hours later. <laughs> Was not prepared to do that today, to be honest. Have a lot of stuff going on um, with my business, with my other work. Um, just like life, right? Trying to like take care of my dog, my house, <laughs> those sorts of things. All right, 10 seconds, and then we're gonna check them. They might need another minute or two. All right. But those are about done. So you can see here, they're getting a little bit dark brown on the edges. Those look about done to me, and they didn't spread as much as I uh, initially thought they would. I think it's gonna make them smaller. Sometimes when the cookies are so big and so tall, if you don't chill them, they will start to spread just because the butter starts to melt before the center starts to cook. I'm gonna put these on a trivet. So, if you're unfamiliar, this is a trivet. You probably know what it is, if, even if you know what the word is. Um, it's just a way for there to be air under the baking sheet. So I'll put that right here, just out of the camera's view. And I'll bake some more cookies so we can see what they like after they've chilled for about 15 minutes. So one thing I do wanna do is take the pan, the inverted baking pan out, because this is really hot. I want to get one now that's cool and do the same thing where I put the baking sheet on a cool pan. So I have a lot of baking sheets. I have like nine or 10 baking sheets for this reason. And so I can have a couple of different uh, baking sheets going at a time and then cool pans to be ready to invert to put the cookies on top of. Um, also, you'll notice that I'm only putting one sheet of cookies in at a time. It's because if you put the oven rack really any lower than the center, the bottoms will get burned. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to grab about five cookies. And yes, I'm like using everything in my hands. I wash my hands a ton. These are also just for me and my husband. I'm just going to like freeze any extra. Uh, when I'm baking orders, especially currently, I will wear a mask. I will touch less things with my hands. <laughs> I will use more spatulas, things of that nature. Um, I usually like to do like a domino pattern. So five cookies like that, just to give them plenty of space in case they do spread out so they do not touch. And then we'll put the cool pan on the bottom. Ooh. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot. Salt. We need more salt. Something fun you can also do is take like large granulated sugar and put on top. You want a little crispy sugar crunch. That's always delicious. All right. That one wants to roll away. Six minutes. Uh, Couple other notes, it's also really good to say organized. I almost touched the hot pan uh, with one of my bare hands. So it's good to just like by habit have this on. I'm pretty bad about that. Also, if you ever worked in kitchens, you probably have kitchen hands where things don't necessarily hurt as much uh, because you've already gotten burned so many times you're desensitized to it or you have less skin or nerve endings on your hands. Um, I can usually pick up fairly hot things like Oh yeah, like this is fine. It's only been out of the oven a couple minutes, but I can pick this up, no problem. Um, but it's like still pretty hot, so just be careful. Now, what I want to do is like check on these. Yes, the bachelor, they do look a little crispy in the bottom. They're not going to be burned. Um, this is what they always look like. The edges always get a little bit browned, often because the marshmallows start to melt and the sugar caramelizes. This is just kind of a reaction junk cookies have. I kind of like the lacy crispy edges. 
as long as the bottoms aren't burned. So it's a little preemptive. I will usually let this cool at least 20 minutes. If I'm packaging them, I try to bake them a couple hours in advance so they're fully cooled, a little bit hardened on the edges. And so if they're going into a box, they don't stick to each other. But for now, for now they're, they're fine to check and I can try them. <laughs> Let's see. Oh yeah, look at that bottom. That's perfect. A little bit golden brown. And now the money shot, right? <sighs> a little gooey in the center. Yes, who doesn't love that? And the marshmallow tear. See, they're still like, because they're so hot, they're still really delicate. Um, once they fully chill or cool after like 20 to 30 minutes, they will stay together really nicely. Still be a little gooey in the center for sure, but obviously they're falling apart because they're still so warm. I'm gonna try it because who doesn't love a warm chocolate chip cookie? Mm. Oh yeah. My favorite part was the salt on top. <laughs> These are so good. So that's my recipe for my vegan junk cookies. Again, use whatever mixins you like. Really love using Oreos and vegan white chocolate to make a cookies and cream variety. I also use this as a base for just my plain old chocolate chip cookies. You could go that route. You could put speculus and cookie butter. I uh, will occasionally, as I'm taking the dough and weighing it, I will roll in a little bit of cookie butter or some kind of nut butter into the center. So when you do that, uh, that crack open, that money shot, you have like melted cookie butter, peanut butter, almond butter coming out of the center. That's a really fun surprise. Or you can uh, also take the marshmallows and roll them into the center and then you have like a puffy marshmallow when you bite into it. Basically just like be creative. My favorite thing is recipes that have some sort of basis in chemistry, right? They will come out to the same texture every time, but that you can really play with and customize and make your own. These vegan junk cookies are amazing. Definitely don't taste vegan. It just tastes like butter and sugar. <laughs> um, and I highly recommend you make these for yourself, for your family, for your friends. I also will have a cookbook coming out in early 2021. These cookies will definitely be in them. So if you want the full recipe, tips, screenshots, and, and pictures along the way, I highly recommend. Uh, checking out the Junk Jewels cookbook. Again, that cookbook will be coming out in 2021. I don't know exactly what month yet. I'm self-publishing. Um, I'm working on it. I got a lot of the copy done already, a lot of the pictures. Just got to lay it out nicely, get it all put together and uh, and bound in the way that an ebook is bound. But these are so good. Really, you should make them. I'm also going to be editing this video and putting it up on YouTube, a condensed version. This was a little over an hour. I'm going to condense down to about 15 to 20 minutes. Just get some highlights in and you can find me there. So YouTube channel is Junk Jewels. Instagram is Junk Jewels. Junk Jewels across platforms. Thank you again for joining me, especially those who have come back from last week's stream. I really hope you enjoyed baking with me today. Let me know what you want me to bake next. Feel free to write it in the chat. Comment on a post on Instagram. I would love to hear what types of wild recipes you want me to try next or within what sort of dietary restrictions you'd like me to work in. Until next time, this has been Extravagant Junk. Tune in next time. We'll make some, uh, some more cookies, I think. I, I'm a big fan of cookies. Ooh, The Bachelor, apple pie cookies. That's a great idea. I actually have not made apple pie cookies. I've done pecan pie bars, pecan pie cookies, but not apple pie. I love that idea. I actually do have some apple butter in my fridge, so let's try that out. I'm gonna experiment with that. Thank you for the idea. All right, I'll see you all next time. Thanks again.